Hi, my name's Carol, and this is Hummingbird Spot. I am so excited to announce the collaboration between Hummingbird Spot and Sherry L. Williamson. Sherry is a lifelong naturalist, conservationist, and birder, and she's known internationally for her research on hummingbirds. She's co-founder and director of the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory, and she's currently undergoing a major rewrite of her book, The Peterson Field Guide to Hummingbirds of North America, that will be published by the Princeton University Press. Now, for Sherry's first video, she's going to be telling us a little bit about the history of feeding hummingbirds and how we came upon that magic four parts water to one part sugar recipe. Take it away, Sherry. Thanks, Carol. Hi, hummingbird spotters. Let's talk about feeder solutions. Now, you already know that one part white sugar to four parts water is the standard solution for feeding hummingbirds, almost universally recommended by hummingbird experts. But did you know that hasn't always been the case? It's actually a fairly long and involved story that goes way back into history. So I'm going to give you the not quite so long version. Just so we're all on the same page, throughout this video I'm going to refer to sugar water the same way that we make it in our own kitchens, using a ratio of sugar to water by volume. So one part sugar to four parts water, that's one to four. One part sugar to three parts water is one to three, and so on. It is important to remember, and it's a little counterintuitive, that the smaller the second number in that ratio, the sweeter the solution ends up being. If you read scientific papers on nectar, you'll usually see the sugar concentration listed differently, usually as a percentage, the weight of the sugar compared to the total weight of the solution. A 1 to 4 ratio by volume is roughly 20% sugar by weight, and a 1 to 9 ratio is about 10% sugar by weight. People have been supplementally feeding wild hummingbirds for at least 200 years, seriously. It started by adding just a few drops of sweetened water to the flowers that the birds were already using, though it wasn't too long before hummingbird enthusiasts began experimenting with small glass vials or jars filled with sweetened water and decorated with red ribbons, scraps of colorful fabric, or even handcrafted imitation flowers. By the early 20th century, pioneering ornithologists such as Caroline Soule and Althea Sherman had begun to experiment with different feeder colors in tracking the bird's sugar consumption. But even these scientists didn't agonize over whether they were feeding the right solution the way many people do today. As a result, the sugar concentrations of early feeder solutions were all over the map, from weaker than a sports drink to stronger than pancake syrup. Early recipes often included honey, either alone or blended with regular sugar, though that gradually fell out of favor after being linked to deadly yeast infections, what's often referred to as tongue fungus. Eventually, some serious enthusiasts, such as May Rogers Webster of New England, decided to bring their recipes closer to nature by tasting the nectar of hummingbird pollinated flowers and then adjusting their sugar water ratios to match that level of sweetness. Mrs. Webster was also among the first to recommend keeping feeder solutions on the weak side, in her words, to avoid enlargement of the liver. She picked up this advice from keepers at the Bronx Zoo, and that source is significant, but more on the issue of liver enlargement in a moment. Ratios of one part sugar to two or three parts water continue to be the most popular recipes throughout most of the 1960s, but change was on the horizon. In 1963, National Geographic magazine ran an article titled, The Man Who Talks to Hummingbirds. The subject was Augusto Ruski, a Brazilian naturalist and environmentalist so respected in his home country that they put him on their money. Ruski kept hummingbirds in aviaries as well as feeding them in his garden and was the first high profile advocate for a one to four ratio, approximately 20% sugar, which he claimed exactly matched the sugar concentration in the nectar of his garden flowers. It took a few years for Ruski's advice to filter into the popular media, but by 1970, most bird feeding experts were recommending one part sugar to four parts water. Ironically, Ruski had changed his thinking by this time and was recommending a much weaker solution. On Ruski's advice, the 1968 edition of Songbirds in Your Garden by John K. Terrace recommended a one to nine recipe. Not many hummingbird enthusiasts and bird feeding experts followed Terrace's lead though, probably because those that tried his 10% solution found that it just didn't get much attention from hummingbirds. 
Meanwhile, scientific researchers were investigating the ingredients in natural flower nectar and how those ingredients varied depending on the plant's preferred pollinators. It turned out that the basic recipe for feeder solution, white sugar and water, is also nature's basic recipe for the nectarous of hummingbird pollinated flowers. Much like the early experiments in artificial feeding, though, the ratio of sugar to water in natural nectar was all over the map. Sugar concentrations in different nectars varied from weaker than the equivalent of 1 to 9 to stronger than 1 to 1. The weakest and strongest nectars are quite rare, though, and the average sugar concentration in over 250 species of plants that were tested fell right around 25 percent, roughly equivalent to a 1 to 3 recipe. Researchers also found that the quantity of nectar was related to the quality. Flowers that produce large amounts of nectar, much like a hummingbird feeder, tend to produce weaker nectars. Another unusual thing about hummingbird pollinated flowers is that their nectars are rich in sucrose, what most of us think of as white sugar. Insects and many nectar drinking birds other than hummingbirds prefer glucose and fructose, the simple sugars that make up sucrose. Hummingbirds make their own glucose and fructose when they digest sucrose, and their bodies can absorb and use both of these simple sugars equally well, something no other animal can do. So it turns out that the recipe of one part white sugar to four parts water, which has only been popular for about the last 50 years, really is backed by solid science. It contains the type of sugar that hummingbirds are uniquely adapted to digest. It's near the average sugar concentration found in hummingbird flowers. And it's sweet enough to keep the birds coming in without being so sweet that it turns syrupy on chilly mornings or crystallizes on dry, windy days. Since a 1 to 4 recipe is slightly less sweet than the nectar of most hummingbird pollinated flowers, it's also less likely to distract the birds from visiting and pollinating native flowers. Hummingbirds and their plants are important players in native ecosystems, providing food and other resources that support thousands of other species. So keeping the birds on the job as pollinators is extremely important. There are times when hummingbirds may benefit from weaker or stronger solutions. In extreme summer heat, when water is more important than energy, Offering the birds a 1 to 5 recipe, maybe in a separate feeder, may help keep them hydrated and cool. From fall through spring, a slightly stronger 1 to 3 ratio may help hummingbirds cope with the stress of migration and cold temperatures by allowing them to feed more efficiently. Urban folklore notwithstanding, a 1 to 3 ratio is perfectly safe for wild hummingbirds because it's well within the range of sugar concentrations found in the nectars of hummingbird pollinated flowers. Liver enlargement, also known as fatty liver disease, is an ailment of captive hummingbirds, a consequence of boredom, unlimited food, and minimal opportunities for exercise. That's why Augusto Ruski was concerned about it. That's why the keepers at the Bronx Zoo were concerned about it. But fatty liver disease is unknown in wild hummingbirds, even though they regularly drink nectar much sweeter than one to four from both wild and cultivated flowers. So there's a pocket history of how one to four became the standard recipe for feeding hummingbirds. If your recipe falls within the range of one to three and one to five, you're doing fine. It's not rocket science. Nature doesn't have one hard and fast recipe for hummingbird nectar, and neither should we. What's more important to keeping your hummingbird clientele healthy and happy is to make sure that your feeder solution is made with fully refined white sugar and good quality tap or filtered water. No dyes, no other additives, preservatives, no commercial solutions. Also, clean your feeders regularly and thoroughly inside and out and avoid pesticides in your garden and around your home that may harm the bird's main food source, which is insects and spiders. So that's all for now. If you're curious about the science behind hummingbird feeding, check the video description for a list of resources. We appreciate you tuning in, and we will see you next time.